Hello, it's Wayne here from Whiskey Alpha. Nine months ago, I bought an aeroplane. And the question that everyone's been asking me now is, has it been a bottomless money pit or was it a great idea? Back in late 2021, I passed my PPL and then I started flying school aircraft. Now, the big problem about flying school aircraft is lack of availability. It's reasonably easy to get a two hour slot but if you want to go a little bit further and book the aircraft out for a little bit longer, say two, four, six hours, then there's a bit of an issue because quite rightly so, the school are there to teach people to fly. And if you're taking an aircraft out for six hours because you want to go to Sandown, then they can't teach someone. So there was always an issue booking aircraft. I decided to start doing my complex rating because the school had a PA-28 Arrow, which was a complex aircraft. The key thing here was the Arrow wasn't being used for general training, so the availability was better. And I did about nine, 10 hours. I was just about to finish my rating on there. I had probably about an hour to go. And then availability kicked in and something broke on the aircraft and the owner decided that he was gonna sell the aircraft. So. I lost my ride, so to speak. March 2022 came around and I saw a share advertised on local Facebook group for the airfield. The usual type of thing, Cessna 172, 1977, one lady owner, etc, etc. Only joking, a little bit more information than that. The first thing I did was contact the person advertising the share and we agreed to meet at the airfield. So I managed to get a closer look at the aircraft. But I admit, I probably spent more time chatting to the guy and discussing the share and how the group worked than actually looking at the aircraft. Mainly because at that point in time, we decided we weren't going to fly due to various logistical reasons. I then spoke to one of the other guys in the share and we actually arranged to go flying and I flew the aircraft from the P2 seat. I'd also done a little bit of research. I'd asked around at the airfield, I'd asked at the flight school, and generally everyone was very complimentary about the aircraft and very complimentary about the group, which was something that I was looking for. One of the things the group members were concerned about is whether I was going to look after the aircraft and use it to fly, or whether I was just there to try and build up my hours, whether I was actually going to become what we call an hour builder. Now, luckily I managed to assure them I wasn't an hour builder. I was just looking for an aircraft that I could have a share in and enjoy the aircraft and go flying. I've got no real aspirations to become a commercial pilot. That's what they pay the big bucks for. By this time, I was possibly a little bit over enthusiastic. I admit I was probably checking my emails and um, my phone every five minutes to see if I'd actually had an answer from the group. The good news is the group actually accepted me and they agreed subject to the usual pay some money. I had a few signatures on a few bits of paper and now I was an owner of one fifth of a Cessna 172. So here I was, I've just spent a large sum of money buying a fifth of a Cessna 172 and now I've got to learn to fly it. One of the criteria for the insurance and for the group as a whole was I had to have at least 100 hours total time and 20 hours on type, which it was a little bit of an issue because I'd only ever flown PA-28s or PA-28 Arrow. So I had zero time on a Cessna. I did have at least 100 hours and I'd still been flying school aircraft since I qualified. So I had the hours total time. I just didn't have the hours on type. Now, there was quite an easy solution to this. One, we spoke to the insurance company who basically said, if you pay us a little bit more money, we'll reduce the hour requirement. But I still needed to get some time in a Cessna because I've never landed one, I've never taken one off. Easy thing to do, go and grab an instructor and go flying. And it was great. Right up to the point where he said, do you realize I've only taken off in one of these twice? Great, but no, it was good. We spent quite a lot of time in the circuit. I got used to the differences. And fundamentally, there's not massive amounts of difference between what I've learned to fly in, which was a PA-28, and a Cessna 172. Big difference is Cessna 172 has got a high wing, so the wings are up here, and a PA-28 has got a low wing, so the wings are down here. And from a passenger's perspective, most passengers want to look down. Most pilots want to look out because we don't want to crash into other aircraft. Looking down is the only thing you do when you're trying to navigate or land but for a passenger, they're going to look down. I want to see my house from here. And the nice thing about a Cessna is, there's no wing in the way. It was great, you could see down. Other little differences, PA-28 landing speeds and approach speeds tend to be a little bit faster than Cessna, so you're probably looking about five knot difference, which wasn't massively difficult to deal with. Another nice thing was everything in the Cessna was working. 
you'll find that when you're flying school aircraft, after a while, things just aren't working because mainly they're not being used all the time. And you might be flying aircraft which have the little in-op notes dotted around. With our Cessna, everything was working, even the stuff that I didn't really want to use or didn't need to use. One nice thing was the fact I didn't have to rush. Normally when you're flying a school aircraft or a rental aircraft, you've got a time slot. So you've got to time everything to the nth degree. You've got to turn up, you've got to do your A checks, take the covers off, etc., etc., etc. And you've always got this element of you've got to be back in a certain time because the next student's going to come up. And it sometimes feels a little bit rushed. With your own aircraft, if you want to spend an hour doing your A checks and an hour taking the covers off and then make sure everything's in the right place in the cockpit, you can do that. It's great. Something else I had to get used to, PA28 wings, because they're low, fuel tanks are in the wing, therefore fueling up is quite easy. You just lean over and put the fuel pump in and it works. With a Cessna, you've got to pull the ladder out, you've got to climb on top of the wing, you have to dip the tanks, and then you have to fill them up, which is a bit more awkward, but it's not a massive issue. So I did a few hours in the circuit, I did a few landaways, and basically got myself used to flying an aircraft that was different to the aircraft that I'd been flying when I did my training. Not massively different, but there's little quirks. For instance, in a Cessna, love the trim wheel, hate the throttle. PA28, love the throttle, hate the flaps lever. The good things about owning a share. I got to go flying. I didn't just get to go flying, I got to go flying in my own aircraft. I know technically I own a fifth of it, it's not my aircraft, but you treat it like that and you treat it like your own. Being part of a group or being part of a share is actually a really good experience. You've effectively got a built-in group of people who have a shared common interest in aviation. And we have a WhatsApp group, we'll sit there and chat about where we want to fly to, what our plans are, what we could do in the future. And it's a really great feeling to be able to just talk to people about flying. And we don't just talk about flying, we go flying. I've flown with David, we tried to do an abortive trip to Latuke. We've done sand down, we've done a few other trips, but it's almost as if you've got a built-in group of people that you can go flying with, and we know the aircraft, and we tend to share the aircraft as well whilst we're flying. So one person will be flying one way, one person flying back, or we might share the, the load, so one person will fly, one person does the radios. And it's a great thing to do. It's not just a solitary, you're stuck in the aircraft, on your own, having to do everything. Fly with other people, it's fun. Another great thing about owning an aircraft as a share is all the costs are shared. So if something breaks or we have an annual, I'm not looking at a big bill, I'm looking at a fifth of a big bill, which is still a big bill, but you get the idea. Availability in our group is pretty good. We have a WhatsApp group and we have a shared calendar. And in the nine months or so that I've been flying, I think there's only been two occasions where I've gone, I want to go flying. Oh, somebody else has booked the aircraft. And one occasion where one of the other guys in the chair said, is there any chance you can move your booking because I've already booked an instructor and I need to finish my IIR, which is no problem. The fact is we discuss about, we talk about when we're going flying. We're a group of friends, so there's compromise there. What's the negatives? There's a few of them, but not massive ones. Availability, possibly an issue because sometimes you're going to get to the point where you want to book it out and other people have already booked it or you want to book it for a longer period of time and then you have to negotiate with the other people in the group. So if I want to take it for two weeks to go into France, for instance, then I have to talk to other people in the group and we all have to agree that they're happy with that. It works out quite well for me because I do a lot of flying during the week and not much at weekends, where some of the other people in the group will do me flying at weekends and not much during the week. So there's a balancing. And with a group of five, we don't have large numbers of people all trying to book at the same time. I've seen groups with up to 20 and you start to look at it and go, can you really get good availability if 20 people are all going to try flying the aircraft, especially when it gets into the summer when flying is, is nice because the weather's nice? Who knows? Five, perfect number for me. Other negatives, things break. Now, I call it a negative, but I've flown school aircraft where things have broken on school aircraft. The difference is with the school aircraft, the school have to deal with it and it's up to them to find me another aircraft. If our aircraft breaks, then we have to deal with it. And it's a case of somebody then has to get it to our engineers and the engineers have to deal with it and we pay the money, etc., etc. I've only lost one flight where this has been an issue. We had a flight planned to Sandown and had a 50 hour booked a couple of days before. Thought it was going to be simple. We flew in to do the 50 hours 
and they found a few things wrong with it, which meant it wasn't going to be ready when we needed it, so we lost the flight, but that's life. Another slight negative is the fact that you can't do what you like all the time. Now, we're a group of five, and a couple of times we've had discussions within the group about things we'd like to do. A couple of us wanted to put some extras, shall we say, and there was a discussion and it was decided we weren't going to put them. Mainly because, let's face it, not everyone wants pink seats and leopard skin headlining. Don't know why. So the question that everyone really wants me to answer is, has it been a good idea? And my simple answer is, for me personally, yes, it's been fantastic. It's the best decision I made since I decided to start to learn to fly. If you get an opportunity to get a share, get a share in an aircraft. It works out to be cheaper than a hiring a renting aircraft from a school. You get more flexibility. You get to fly with a group of friends, potentially. I mean, if you've got a share of two people and the other person's never around, then it's a bit more difficult. It gives you a lot more flying and it gives you more of a shared experience in flying. What advice would I give you if you're thinking of buying a share? Well, I'm actually going to do another video about this. The main things I would advise you is firstly, do your research. Make sure that the aircraft you're looking at is going to be right aircraft for you. If you're looking at a two-seat aircraft and you're a family with wife and daughter, wife and son, etc., etc., two-seat aircraft's not going to be the right aircraft for you. And equally, if you're on your own, are you paying extra for a four-seat aircraft or an aircraft that can do acrobatics, etc., etc.? Make sure the aircraft is the right aircraft for you. Secondly, talk to other members of the group because the group is almost as important as the aircraft, if not more. The aircraft is a mechanical device, providing it's being looked after and it's regularly maintained, it will fly. The group, you can have some seriously bad group dynamics where you can have someone in a group who all they do is complain and it just gets really stressful. Equally, don't forget a group and a shared aircraft. It's an investment. It's not just something that's gonna last for five minutes. You're going to pay a chunk of money into there, and in order to get out of that group, you've then got to find someone to sell the share to, unless you're just gonna throw the money away, which is not a great idea. But it's an investment. Consider, like all investments, the value of your investment can go down as well as up, but think about what you're doing. Is this right for you? Does the group seem the right place for you? Talk to the other members of the group, see how often they fly, ask about availability, look at maintenance, ask them about maintenance, who's responsible for it, how many items in the aircraft have just been passed over and they're, oh, we'll do that in the next annual. Things like that will soon show issues. Who keeps the records? Ask to see the accounts. Big question is going to be something like, is there an engine fund? Now, aircraft don't last forever. There are going to be big bills popping up from time to time, engine overhauls, for instance. Now, we don't have an engine fund for the very simple reason that we all looked at this and looked at the costings on a monthly and a yearly basis and agreed that we could all afford the cash call that would be required if we had to replace the engine. And these days, engine 30, 40,000 UK pounds, that's not unusual. But split that against five, all of us could afford or had at least some of that sorted away. So if it did come an issue, we were there, we could actually pay for that rather than having an engine fund that built up over time, which would basically mean that our monthly flying would be more expensive. We've had a couple of changes in costings. When I first joined, the hourly rate and the monthly fees were slightly lower. Unfortunately, good old fuel surcharges kept going up and up and up. The airfield have increased their charges, so we re-evaluated the costings, and it all comes down to, this is how much it actually costs, and we have to pay the bills. So the charges went up, but it's still cheaper than flying a rental aircraft. That's it, basically, did I make the right decision? Yeah, I think so. It didn't turn out to be a bottomless money pit. It was a good investment. It means I can go flying, I'm enjoying it more, and it's been great. Hopefully this video has helped you. Don't forget, if you like what I'm doing, please consider the old subscribe thing that appears down here and the old thumbs up. If you've got any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. But whatever you do, please have fun and fly safe. Bye.